Thank you for checking out my YouTube channel, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today I am happy to bring you a very special guest. You know his voice, but now you actually get to see the man himself. None other than the History of the World podcast, Chris Haslow. Nice to meet you, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. I'm so excited about this, man. Like I said, I mean, I've been uh, debating on what you actually look like this whole time. And now that I see we both have beards, I feel an even better connection other than history. So <laughs> now that is awesome. So we're going to start this off by uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll go on from there. Well, unsurprisingly, I'm, uh, I'm from England, as you can tell by the accent. Um, I'm uh, I'm not um, educated. I'm not an academic in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. My my interest in history sort of come after I left school, really, and I started collecting material like literature, like much as yourself, Nick. I can see you're surrounded by it there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but myself, <laughs> I, I I I took this sort of journey in, uh, an interest in history at, at an older age really um and um yeah the, basically i come up with the idea of the podcast because i was looking for something uh, that sort of does what my podcast says on the tin and uh, i couldn't really find anything out there it's very like sort of scarce material when it comes to popular history um a lot of stuff that's um sort of directed towards uh, particular aspects of history but not anything that was sort of general uh, popular history as we like to call it uh, so that's where I jumped in and uh, and here I am doing it now. So that is absolutely awesome. I think I'm the first I'll be the first to say that it's no secret that your audios are the most popular recordings on my channel. People tend to really, really love what you do. And I think what I like most about it is uh, it's not just like little brief subjects like you see constantly. It's these long, in-depth explorations of certain peoples and certain topics. And what I love most is you tend to cover, you're covering pretty much everybody in each area as you go along. And so you're really presenting a really awesome and broad history that I feel like a lot of people don't get anywhere else. And so I think that's one thing that makes your podcast unique. Um, tell us about your long-term goals for the podcast. Are you going to uh, continue up to the present day if time permits, or what's your plans? Well, well, I think when I started the project off, I, I, it was something that I wanted to see through to the end. You know, I didn't want it to be um, one of those things where I sort of dipped in and then uh, didn't continue it. Um, you know, you read a lot of uh, places on, on the internet where people have uh, tried podcasts and they say normally like episode 7 to 15 of the graveyard of podcasts <laughs> that don't work out. So um, to get uh, to get the other side of that, I felt, well, actually, perhaps I am going somewhere with this. Um, realistically, I, had to, I sort of had to be realistic when I started out, Nick, um, in terms of whether this was doable. Um, and because it's because there's such a lot to cover and, and you have to be sort of quite mindful of the amount of information that you need to pack in. And like, I didn't want to be the one to expire before my podcast did, you know, like, so like you sort of, <laughs> understandable. You, know, you can have like a hundred year plan and I'm not going to make it to the end. But I think realistically, I think, um, you know, the, the plan is maybe seven volumes, each tackling a different era in history. And realistically, it could take seven to ten years, um, which, you know, hopefully I won't be too grey by the end of that period. And, uh, you know, I'll make it. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think um, I'm motivated certainly to do it. So I think and I, and I do have a, a general plan of action for it. So I'm, not, I'm sort of not going blindly into it. I sort of think I know what I, I want to do and like, over the next sort of course of the next few years with it so yeah I, I think there is sort of a definite plan and uh, it's all going according to plan at the moment I'm pleased to say. Excellent that is what we like to hear um, yeah I'm super excited about that right now of course you started off in human prehistory with volume one 
Volume two is the ancient world, which my fans are currently eating up at the moment. Your fans also, I'm happy to say from what I'm seeing, a lot of my subscribers are starting to head your way. And that's actually my long-term goal of working with podcasts like yourself is to try to direct my audience to you as much as possible. Um, I must say what I'm really dying for, and I've mentioned this before, I cannot wait until you get to Europe. Oh my gosh. Ancient Europe is going to be awesome, especially when you hit my favorite subject which will be the Celtic speaking peoples one day we'll get there. I know. Um, yeah. So uh, that's, that's absolutely exciting. Do you ever have uh, plans on possibly hosting guests on your show? Um, I, when I first started out, it really wasn't the, the, the game plan, but I think, um, you know, sometimes I listened to um, Ryan Stitt of the history of ancient Greece podcast, who, has given me no, so much support. I, I'm, I can't tell you how grateful I am to him. He discovered my co my podcast as a fledgling podcast, and I don't know if um, I don't know if anyone is sort of widely aware of this, but he recently had Dr. Moody Al Rashid on his podcast. Who uh, she's an Assyriologist who yeah. who actually sort of translates cuneiform. Uh, and they, and and she actually lectures in it as well. And her podcast on uh, with Ryan in an interview format was was wonderful. It really was a, a terrific insight. And I think there is uh, scope, you know, potentially to have guests on the podcast and explore particular subjects more in depth. And I think that does have. I mean, in, we've never really had this in uh, in you know in the accessible historians sort of. Um, you know, like I, I find it hard to find the words, Nick, but it's it's really like the podcast uh, um, forum. Yeah. It's not something we've really had until recently. And so the the listener experience and the learning opportunities for, for sort of Joe public is now really it's there. You know, it's really there. You can like you can learn about the things that you want to learn about. And the fact that so many of us now are, are sort of embarking on these journeys of discovery means that everyone can now sort of enjoy that. And so, yeah, I do think podcast interviews have a very, very important place in this, you know, in what we do. And um, it, it, it is beneficial to people. So it is something that I would think about. There's no plan of action at the moment for it, I'll be honest with you. But, you know, it's not something that I'm closed minded to. No, I completely understand. I think I, you actually touched on something very important there that I also agree with. And that is, you know, right now in our day and age with technology being what it is, we now have some of the greatest minds literally at our fingertips. And so it's uh, I've actually got a whole bunch of uh, different uh, experts lined up that I'm going to start hosting on my channel. And the fact that I can now not only educate myself because I, I personally don't have a higher education than a high school diploma. And uh, I never had time to go to college or anything like that. But uh, it gives me access to some of the greatest minds on topics that I love, does the same thing to my viewers. And we get the uh, the education we've always wanted without one, having to spend the money. And number two, <laughs> without actually having to leave our houses. You know, I've actually got one lined up for this Saturday and it's going to be on the ethnicity of uh, the Sea Peoples, which I think you'll enjoy that one as well. Okay. And I'm going to be interviewing an expert all the way from the Netherlands, so I have to get up at uh, 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a it's going to be a wonderful day. <laughs> but I'm I'm, I'm really excited. Funny. That is a YouTube hit waiting to happen. Uh, the latest episode uh, that you mentioned by the History of Ancient Greece podcast was that the one on uh, medicine in ancient Mesopotamia. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be bringing that one to YouTube shortly too. I'm actually dying to work on that. That'll be a lot of that'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, two amazing uh, individuals there in Ryan and uh, Dr. Moody. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've been I've been pestering him about possibly doing video recordings uh, whenever he records the academics, maybe do some Skype so I can work that in too, but Quite we'll right. see. <laughs> it's a it's a work in process. Oh, we need to see these people. I know, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, that's the thing. When you uh, when you can see it, man, that really just widens the variety of an audience that you get. Because, you know, we're so – just look at our fascination with art and stuff like that. We're so visual as a species that I feel like adding a video of us talking on top of the illustration and music and sound effects really just captures the audience. But I'm really excited about this. And like I said, I'm really happy to actually meet you in person. 
So let's uh, let's get down to business. A little bit more details about you. Let's uh, start with the kind of easy, broad question. It may not be easy because if someone asks me what my favorite history books are, I really can't uh, I can't name a ton of them instantly. I have to really think on it. But uh, who's uh, let's say your top five favorite history books? Well, I did, do you know what? I, I, I change I change with the wind. Me as like in any of my interests, I sort of from one year to the next they go they go different. I don't really what I don't really read a lot of academic scholars books. I'm very much I like reference books, but there are there were there have been some that have captured my attention. Certainly, um, Yuval Noah Harari. Who um, who wrote the uh, sap, uh, Sapiens? You you may call Sapiens. I would suggest oh, yeah. over there. Um, and Homo Deus. Um, you know those those books are very sort of engaging books. I've found. Um, obviously, we've got the BBC over here in uh, in the UK, and um, they, they work quite heavily in that kind of field. And um, I know um, they they released a book on the cold war and a lot of um interesting stuff to do with that um a name escapes me now bridget give me one minute nick i'm just gonna put <laughs> it because i know where this book is her name uh bridget kendall is her there, name. there we go she, i think she works for bbc radio 4 if i'm not mistaken and uh, she's written an incredible book which um where she has actually um interviewed people who were there through the different phases after the Second World War and right through to the, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, that once again, it, it's um, it's a, a literary version of the radio series. So it's um, once again incredible. But then, um, you know, you get your your books such as uh, Mary Beard, SPQR with the Romans and... Um, you know, we had a we had an author called uh, Michael Axworthy who, who recently passed away. Um, who wrote? She, uh, he was actually a diplomat um, involved with the Iranian embassy here in the UK, and he wrote a history of Iran, which um, you know we often sort of um, you know when it comes to the Middle East, we're often sort of pushing it to the sidelines. But like, yeah. there's no more important place in the world when it comes to human yeah. evolution and. Um, you know, the more we learn about countries like Iraq and Iran, you know, it's very enriching to sort of learn about countries in the Middle East. And, you know, obviously books like that sort of bring the world closer together as well, which I think is sort of a, something that's quite close to my heart. So um, well, how many is that? You said five. Goodness me. Oh, no, right. <laughs> you put me right. <laughs> um, we don't even keep it at five. We can just keep going. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I don't know how many, maybe three or four, I gave you there, but yeah, that was off, that was off the. And, I, and the, actually, I, I I did um I did get a book recently, and um, it's by an author, Reza Aslan, I think is the name, and um, it's about it's about the history of religion, and I, and it's rare to see a book written on that subject with without um without it being sort of biased or slanted towards any one sort of belief system. So um, that was a book I, I sort of saw on a bookshelf recently. It's called, and I'll tell you in a minute, it's called God, A Human History of Religion. So it might be a bit deceptive, the fact that the title says God, but it yeah. really is an exploration into all the world's religions. So, and I think that's important as well to embrace literature to do with that rather than just history to understand religion it's a very as we know from the work that we've done together nick um religion the religion is a very you know it's a very uh, it's a subject that sort of invokes huge passion from a lot of people and um there are a lot of people with very strong feelings about it that you know and they're not always respectful of one another when they're discussing it and um you know i feel it we have a duty to learn as much as possible about the you know everyone's religious beliefs to be able to be sort of tolerant of each other's religious beliefs so it's a very I, I, I'm, I feel quite strongly about that subject personally so um i like to read as much as possible on that kind of subject as well but uh yeah maybe that's five books nick i don't know i don't know you put me on the spot there i feel like I'm no you're good man. About I cope with that question to be honest uh, that's one thing me and the steve from the history of the papacy podcast we winged it our whole interview that we did together and i'm, I'm perfectly fine with just a uh <laughs> relaxing conversation i will say uh 
I agree. I've always pushed for uh, there being here in the U.S., especially due to our own issues, having almost like a comparative religions class in high schools. That way you can learn not just about Christianity, but Islam, Judaism, I mean, even Zoroastrianism, you know, so many going back to the paganistic religions. That way people can see how they have in common, what they have in common, what they don't have in common, and really how in so many ways, if you look at like the religions of the book, you know, they all come from Judaism. Judaism, that's a big debate on where that actually originated. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but, uh, but no, that's the thing. You know, see how it's all connected. And I think if people could see, especially here in the USA with such the social issues that we have, that way, you know, Muslims, Jews, and Christians can actually see, like, they're really not that different. They have differences, absolutely, especially when it comes to theology and the history of each one. But in the end, they are so similar. You know, it's no secret they have the same God. Some of them have the exact, well, actually, all three have the exact same prophets in most cases, but uh, different prophets as well. And I find it absolutely fascinating. Uh Cambridge actually, I think, just put out a two-volume set on uh, religions of the ancient world. I can't remember who the author is, but I think I'm going to try to snatch one as soon as I find it in person. I was going to say, where uh, where in England do you actually live? Well, um, I live in a county called Essex, which oh, um, yes. yes, directly northeast of London, and hence, oh, yeah. hence the accent. It's very, um, it's very sort of. Um, traditional london accent might or, or cockney as as it's as, as you hear it called in the uk uh, yeah. and uh, much of essex is really just sort of an overspill of london nowadays where it used to it used to be a lot different you know years ago well, fascinatingly enough you always look at the history of your local area doesn't it and so so essex carries its own story and the accent certainly used to be different and but now yeah it's sort of as London gets bigger and bigger, we're all getting like sort of pulled <laughs> into this black hole that is London. <laughs> so. It happens. As we both know, people typically debate uh, what your accent is on YouTube. I constantly get a ton of, <laughs> I swear, that's probably the most asked question on every single video that I do of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is that accent? Or they guess or they argue about it or it's just, oh, it cracks me up. It Australia, absolutely Australia is normally the, um, yeah, that's, I've oh, noticed yeah. that, yeah. which is so funny. Cause I, I've heard so many and I've actually, I used to watch a bunch of Australian crime shows. I know that's random, but they put out some really good mob shows shows back in the day and uh i never once thought australian i thought that was so funny that so many people automatically think of australia i spent a little bit of time in the uk and i think that's why the first time i heard your recording i automatically assumed you were english or at least british even though accents can vary depending on what part of the british isles you're at you know but uh that's uh, that's funny i will say uh, you mentioned the cold war uh, if everything goes according to plan, next year I may actually be coming out with a Cold War-based YouTube channel Excellent. to uh, kind of go along with this one. I got to thinking if I could do what I do on this channel on that one, host people, possibly ex-KGB, ex-CIA. Obviously, they can't tell me too much, but they can give <laughs> me a, their, uh, their insights. I don't have to know if they popped somebody back in the day, but if they did tell me, that would also be pretty awesome at the same time. Well, that <laughs> might be it's your job to try, and, <laughs> your, 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 to try and extract that information from them. Right, <laughs> right. If I get contacted by somebody, I'm going to make sure I put it on YouTube. That way they can't kill me yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh that's why that's one thing i'm hoping for but i'm still i'm not quite sure i know i'm gonna eventually the more academics that i interview i'm gonna eventually come up with a podcast the study of antiquity in the middle ages because i'll still i'll still keep continue to uh put out stuff on youtube like normal but it'll also be nice to double dip per se when it comes to an audience and uploading audio is so much easier than having to add so much footage to you know so sure, i'm sure there's a market for it Oh, yeah. So the next big question for you, and this is a, maybe an easier one, possibly. Do you like history movies? Um, not so much, actually. I, I will watch them. I, I don't go out of my way to watch them. I'm much more of a literature man. But some sometimes, I mean, I mean, the um, the concern you have with history um, movies, I mean, look, if, if it's if it's authentic, then it's always going to be worth watching. 
Um, but there's always going to be a degree of dramatization, I think. And like, like the biggest example I can use of a historical figure that's been sort of dramatized to death almost is Cleopatra, yeah. who now is is as comes over to us now as this sort of sultry sort of you know this this temptress, you know. And really, my view of Cleopatra when I read about her is nothing of the sort. I think that she's she's a, a diplomat, you know, and uh, you know where where she sort of put herself was, you know, in you know without going into too much depth, obviously, because it wasn't the question you asked me. Oh, no, you're good, you're good. And um, but like you know, with, with Egypt being uh, you know a flay, uh, you know, a flailing country. Um, and she uh, and her mission was really to save her mother country and to keep her, uh, you know, to keep her legacy and her bloodline going. And that's for me, that's the read that I get of the Cleopatra. So when I see Elizabeth Taylor, like sort of draped across, you know, these like sedan couches and all that kind of thing, you know, I think, well, that's not the Cleopatra I see when I read. So, so that, for that reason, I'm always tentative about dramatization, like visual dramatizations, but, um, you know, you can't deny that there can be, you know, there are some good, um, movies out there. You look at things like Braveheart are quite invoking <laughs> of the imagination, even if there are sort of, you know, little things where you can sort of say, well, actually, you know, that, that can't have happened because he wasn't alive when that happened. And that, oh, yeah. you know, so you can pick you can pick holes in it, but you can still get a good feeling from it, you know, and, uh, you know, like so. Um, yeah, there is a there's a definite place for that kind of thing, I think. And like so, but I don't like to take it too seriously. You know, I'd rather read my book if I'm looking for sort oh, of. Yeah. I did, but yeah, certainly. Yeah. Who who can't love a good film, you know? So, but no, I uh, I agree, especially when it comes to uh, Cleopatra. I've like you said, I've never really seen her as the temptress. A lot of shows try to make her almost seem, uh, I guess, I don't know if whorish is the correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. so. You know, and they, they typically try to make her look like a supermodel, you know, someone yeah. that all oh, men are automatically going to be aroused by physically. Yeah. But I've always looked at it as Caesar and Mark Antony having more of a, uh, because she is a powerful woman, she's obviously incredibly smart. And I think that's one thing that I feel like all these different men were attracted to is not necessarily how she looked, but because she was a powerful, almost just like them, but a woman. Yeah. And in a Roman society, especially, that kind of a woman is a little bit less, uh, I could say, normal because of all the restrictions women had on them within Roman society. Not to say there were plenty of powerful women throughout Roman history, like Livia, for example, but Cleopatra is this uh, – she doesn't necessarily care how Roman society views her. She is who she is, and you know, and she's uh, – no one can deny the power – that she possesses and her intellect, especially when it comes to messing in certain situations. I mean, this is a woman who had no issue taking over the throne, uh, consolidating power. And like you said, in the end, she was doing everything she could to save her own country. She may have made a poor choice with uh, Mark Anthony in the end, but you know, <laughs> we wouldn't have that tragic, powerful ending if she would have chose, you know, to uh, side with uh, Octavius, you know, or Agrippa. And so... Well, that's what makes history so interesting, isn't oh, yeah. it? Those uh, those suppositions and you know the the ideas and like like you say, it's like like the Romans would have had to have appreciated Cleopatra's standing and the fact that you know much of the country would have supported her. So the, the Romans couldn't just walk into Egypt and expect exactly. everyone to bow down. You know, if it, you know you see historically, if someone invades a country, that, that doesn't automatically make the entire population Roman. They've got yeah. to be seduced into that way of life to be, um, you know, to to be subject. And Cleopatra was a very important um, aspect of that, you know, aspect of that political shift, you know, they they needed her to be on side and she needed to try and choose the right person, you know, and um, like you say, she probably got it wrong, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but just you a, know, just I still bit. admire just her, I still find her a, like, oh, a, no, a character of history that I, I really admire for her, like, you know, her back was against the wall and she, you know, she, she didn't, she... She went right up to the end, you know, trying to do the right thing. So, 
Oh, yeah. No, I 100% I agree. And I know this is going to sound really weird, but uh, I've always admired, and I have no idea why, but I always admire historical figures who choose to rather commit suicide rather than fall into enemy hands. I know a lot of people in today's society, I feel like we're typically programmed to view suicide as almost a form of cowardice, especially in cinema. Whenever a military leader is going to be captured, usually the bad guy will commit suicide or so on and so forth. But I never uh, I never viewed it as that. You know, I always viewed it throughout history, suicide, especially uh, if you've been dishonored or if you have done something dishonorable, it's always been a very respectable form of death and a widely acknowledged one. And so I always liked the fact that rather than let the Romans take her – and parade her through the streets like they had done to like Vercingetorix, for example, in the past, she was like, no, you know, if they're going to parade anything, it'll be my lifeless body. They won't have the pleasure of parading me as I am now. And I always, always liked that. I mean, going throughout history, certain generals before falling into enemy hands, they would kill themselves, you know, and I think that I always liked that. It one. It takes a lot of guts to do that. <laughs> Regardless, I don't even know if I would have the constitution to do that, you know, because it's such a, I mean, ugh, that's that's just hard to hard to fathom, you know. But uh, on uh, TV shows, I will say uh, Sky, which I believe is a British entertainment company, they're uh, putting out. I was really excited. I just read about this. It's going to be an upcoming series called Domina, and I don't know the whole storyline yet. But it's a, it's definitely about a Roman woman. But I think it may take place in Roman Britain. I'm not 100 percent sure. But I was, oh, as soon as I saw that, because I, I will admit I'm sadly a really big movie slash TV show guy. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, finally, another one, another one. I don't care how bad they are. I'll watch them at least once. <laughs> and so that's why uh, I really disliked Britannia season one, because it just did not go the way I was hoping. But season two's on its way, and I know I'm going to watch it regardless. So, you know, it <laughs> it happens. I uh, I love the guy they got to play as the Roman governor. He, uh... He played another governor, ironically, in The Walking Dead. I cannot remember his name, but he's a very good British actor, even though his name escapes me at the moment. But uh, so there's that. That's not David, David Morrissey, was it? Is that? I think so. Maybe, yeah. I, I think so. Morrissey. Yeah. Uh, so another good question that may may be easy, maybe not. When it comes to classic historians. Do you have a favorite? And let's say by classical historians, not necessarily like our modern classics like Will and Ariel Durant or uh, Henry Breasted, but more of like the ancient historians. Do you have any particular favorites? Not really, no, because I'll be honest with you. I'm not very learned in that area, Nick. And I think when I when I approach the podcast, it really is just like um, a hazard of where I fell into the ancient and the classics it's really not my field to be honest with you i like sort of um my 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 sort of passion it, it exists with um i would say um 20th century europe mm -hmm. and um maybe sort of the Brit british history in the last thousand years so i'm i'm almost very new to this myself and i think um in terms of the podcast, what I've discovered, so I've almost felt a little bit guilty doing the podcast. <laughs> I think, like you know, uh, you know, do I believe that I'm any kind of authority in terms of um, teaching or, or lecturing on this subject? Um, but then I've seen that there is a positive aspect to that, so that I can sort of um, present information as I'm coming across it myself. And that almost, it's almost like I'm leading the listener by the hand yeah. through, through my own journey. And like, as long as I sort of present it respectfully and, um, and study it correctly, I think, you know, I think it is coming out. It, it does seem to be sort of taken quite popularly. So in terms of, um, you know, people who, um, sort of inspired me there certainly isn't no one through this period because it's something i'm quite new to studying so yeah that's an honest answer to that yeah oh no i i perfectly agree and i respect that i uh when it comes to the classics i've only read a few myself just the really basics you know a little bit of tacitus suetonius gotta read some herodotus occasionally yeah. <laughs> herodotus <laughs> is uh, unavoidable. Most disputed disputed <laughs> historians first historian Yes, we yeah. know unavoidable is uh, very yeah. Um, wide, yeah, wide ranging works. 
that Herodotus done. And, and it's absolutely fascinating to pick apart the, you know, when, when you read when you read works such as Herodotus, you're, you're desperately trying to think, now, what kind of bias or persuasion was at play when he wrote that? And, and so, so it's almost like a bit of it's a, it's a bit of a game. It's like that's the challenge of reading that kind of thing is, um, you know, picking apart, you know, it's oh, yeah. it's that whole truth. Or do I need to triangulate that with another source? And, like, you know, sort of um, or does that marry up to what we've discovered since? You know, so it is, that that's probably the 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 um, the most exciting part about reading sort of classic um, sort of you know lit- literature if you like. No, I completely agree. I uh, I agree when it comes to uh, Herodotus. Some people like to call him the father of lies. I kind of <laughs> disagree with that stance, and I always say, what if we can all agree that he's the uh, father that a lot of people lied to? You know what I mean? Especially the Egyptians. They they took that guy for a run for their for his money, uh, especially when it comes to trying to tell him how much they influenced the Greeks or they got this from us, you know? And I always wondered how much, you know, that they just actually just made up as a joke to tell this guy, you know, just to screw with the uh, the new guy that showed what? up, so... Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think it's like, you know, in, a, in an era is like that classic Game of Thrones, isn't it? Yeah. It's, like, it's You know, it's the, you know, these people were, you know, the ultimate propagandists, if if ever you was going. They had the influence, you know, these were illiterate societies and so people like Herodotus could have the run of the green if they, if they were respected enough. You know, they could either be misinformed or they could have a motivation to the information that they were dishing out. So you like, you know, for me, once again, that excites me, the fact that you, you sort of read it and you're trying to write, I'm going to see if I can catch this guy out, you know, like sort of, I'm going to see if I can like sort of pick the bones out of what he's saying and like, and, you know, prove, prove him wrong where necessary. So like, I think oh, yeah, no, I, I agree. There is a uh, a classic BBC series that came out, I mean, decades ago at this point. I'm wondering if you've seen it. Have you ever watched I, Claudius? Yeah, I'm aware of I, Claudius. Yeah, yeah, I'm, it's, yeah. Uh, I will say it is, a, it is a favorite of mine. I can unfortunately watch that over and over and over. And I think it's because it's so funny because it almost perfectly captures Suetonius's works, you know, because he was such a almost like a tabloid writer of his day, like all the drama and gossip and having to figure out how much of it he's exaggerating and how much he's not. Uh, of course, they picked the perfect guy to play my favorite emperor. I, I love Claudius. He's probably my favorite Roman emperor of all time. Uh, and the the actor whose name literally again, ugh, I can't believe it. It's literally left me. He play, He's been in so many shows at this point. Oh, it's going to eat me alive now. But anyway, he's a great actor. Uh, but that was, that was a favorite of mine. So the next question is, let's, uh, let's talk about your favorite subjects when it comes to history. Well, yeah, I like, so I touched upon, I think, um, where I, like, what I really love is, um, you know, being British and, and particularly English, the story of our monarchy is absolutely fascinating. And when you sort of walk that journey, and like, you know, often it's presented as, sort of the last thousand years since William the Conqueror uh, invaded and the Battle of Hastings in 1066. But you can actually go back before that to um, the, the great Anglo-Saxon kings such as Alfred the Great. Um, and you can actually, you know, oh, it's, it's great for me because I can just jump in a car and go and see these places. I can go to Winchester and I can visit the cathedral and I can... You know, I can find the round table, um, you know, which was supposedly belonged to King, uh, king Arthur, the legendary king who we, no one knows if he ever existed or not. <laughs> um, you know, so so the, the, the intrigue of English history is fantastic. Um, there are so many stories of, um, you know, deceit and, you know, um, the royal court was like a, you know a, a minefield of like sort of you know sometimes it would be like debaucherous and at other times it would be like downright conniving um you know it's, it's for me that's really what i love the most and i think that's what introduced me to podcasting is the fact that i don't know if you've heard of a, a of a podcast called rex factor oh no 
it's uh, done. It's actually um, presented by a couple of gentlemen who, who live quite near to me. And it was the first sort of podcast that I come across and became hooked on. And what they do is this wonderful uh, sort of, it's, it's like a game, if you like, where it's like, it's like X Factor, the famous sort of, uh, oh, yeah. famous, um, you know, entertainment show where people are trying to win uh, win over the rest of them. And so they, they've transposed that sort of idea into the kings and queens of, of England initially in their first series. So they review a different monarch each show, uh, give them a score for their battliness and their you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, you know, how long they reigned, how many children they had. And then uh, ultimately it goes to the vote whether they've got the Rex Factor or not. And then they, they progress to the next round. And it's it, very hard to not get hooked on it. But also it was uh, the the gentleman who, um, um, Graham and Ali are the two gentlemen that do it. And Graham does all the study and Ali does absolutely no studying whatsoever. He's just there for entertainment. <laughs> it's, it's the comedy foil, if you like, for Graham who's sort of the straight man and it just works the podcast just absolutely works and it's the, a fantastic introduction into um the monarchy of, of england you know and like they did the scottish monarchy in their second series like that really for me um that i got hooked to that podcast because i'm i'm absolutely i love the history of the the english monarchy i just um you know that really sort of excites me and then I suppose the other subject will be, like as I said, the uh, the politics that that surrounded the First and Second World War. You know, particularly in Europe. Um, you know, it's just it's just absolutely fascinating to sort of get into that story and and the domino effect of everything that was going on at that period. And uh, that points to another uh, history podcast, which um, by Zach Twamley, who. Um, when diplomacy fails yes um, and he explores that the politics and he's he's such a clever i think he's only he's a very young man he's such a talented podcaster um i can't get over how sort of you know how how well he grips these complex subjects of like sort of um diplomacy between nations and you know obviously when it fails you know is there oh, yeah. to sort of tell us the story of that the bit the, the nitty-gritty the bit that we want to hear about um so yeah i think um that's you know that's why i'm doing what i do today because of the the subjects that that you've asked me about nick that i'm passionate about i've i've discussed when i've been looking in the marketplace for podcasts to cover it i've found those podcasts and then because I've got a general, um, you know, a general passion for popular history, I started looking for that and I couldn't find what I was looking for. And so therefore, here I am. So full circle. But yeah, they're, they're the, you know, modern history is sort of probably ironically considered <laughs> putting out at the moment. That's probably where my passion lies. No, I completely agree. And a little secret about me. Occasionally, I've mentioned it in previous videos, but uh my best subjects are not ancient and medieval history at all. I kind of uh, I go with ancient and medieval history because it is YouTube friendly. Uh, unless it's talking about race and ethnicity, there's really nothing that controversial about ancient history. Unless it's the the race question involving the ancient Egyptians or you know uh, ancient Romans. People on YouTube always get fired up, but it's oh. uh, it's good for views. So I mean it it happens, but uh. No, I'm uh, actually the 19th and 20th century are probably my best subjects as well. I've actually, uh, I don't hardly take pictures of them. It's hard to find uh, World War II books that don't have swastikas plastered all over them. So I can't put those on social media for obvious reasons. They'll get flagged. But uh, I'm actually quite the Third Reich buff, uh, mm -hmm. especially the Second and Third Reich. I've studied that for most of my life, actually. It uh, got to a point when I was younger, my parents were worried because I was always reading all these books about Nazi Germany. And I had to promise my parents over and over, I'm not a fascist. I promise. <laughs> I just really like the history. And so I feel like that's something every young World War II buff always has to struggle with with their parents is, now I'm not mini Hitler. I just really like reading about it. So, <laughs> but uh well, I think it's an important subject. I think oh, you have to understand. You have to understand, um, and and like, of course, it's uh, you know, it's in our it's in our family's own lifetimes that kind of thing. So, it, I think it's important to learn and read about that kind of thing because we, as the next generation, need to understand. 
Yes. Why that happened and uh, how we avoid that kind of thing happening again. Oh, and, I, uh, I if you if you look deeply into it, you can understand the, the you know it you know it might not have been possible the, you know in the aftermath of the First World War to telegraph that um, that eventuality, um, but certainly you can understand the sequence of events that led to it. And I think, you know, that's important for oh, yeah. for us as human beings to learn and understand those, those things. I think they're fundamental to our view of today's world. No, I completely agree. I actually, uh, I've also collected a ton of history related artifacts, especially from world war two and especially from the third Reich. And I had a friend that asked me, he's like, why do you collect that? And I said, I've always believed that one day it'll be gone. And aside from pictures, you'll never fully be under well, you'll never fully be able to understand what it was. And seeing, let's say, the real Nazi flag or the armbands or uh, the German coins, that is one of the best ways to show people this is not only what a truly violent political mo movement looks like, but it's also responsible for one of the most vicious killing cycles of the 20th century. You know, and here in the U.S., we have a really big problem with that. And for understandable so, there's a lot of people that they buy those uh, artifacts for uh, ulterior reasons, not related to history, but due to political parties, white supremacism. And I acknowledge that. And I 100% I disagree with that. I do not condone that. As far as I'm concerned, every single person on this earth is my equal, 100%. And I can think of quite a few that are definitely smarter than me. So <laughs> I... Uh, but I always tell people there was a teacher in California who almost got fired uh, from his high school class. He was supposed to teach about the Holocaust, and he went out and he got some stuff that was related to the uh, Third Reich because he wanted to show his kids this is what horror looks like. This is what you know his equivalent of evil looks like. Well, the problem was parents really did not like that, and uh, I mean it's it's I can see their concern and stuff like that. But for me, I don't want kids. To not see that and possibly grow up and they hear uh, people who are maybe less tolerant they talk and their views affect their children so on and so forth and I think my thing is wanting my kids to be able to see that so they know that when they see it in real life that that's not good that's what that, that represents you know it's supposed to be horrifying it's supposed to be uncomfortable you know it's for the shock factor and uh my uh, my uncle actually he fought the Germans in World War II. He got a Purple Heart. He came back. Uh, his brothers all fought against the fascists on the Japanese front. And I always tell people, you know, for my family's history, I'm always proud to say that when uh, fascism was attempting to conquer Europe and conquer China and Asia, my ancestors were one of you know groups of thousands and thousands of men and women who fought you know, against those exact things. And it's, it's happy to see that. And I can almost tell my kids, you know, it's though they did not bring that back because of what they see, this collection of empire materials that I've got in my office, my family helped bring that down. And I always, I always thought that was kind of a cool thing that I'll be able to pass on to my children. I've actually thought about doing a uh, rise and fall or a uh, rise and fall of the third Reich podcast. I just haven't actually went for that yet, but that's a, a little bit of information about me, but I love World War One. I. I love World War Two. The Cold War is a big, big favorite of mine. I oh, so much shady business went down all over the East and West during that, you know, unofficial conflict per se. So uh, that's uh, that's a little bit about me. Um, hmm. I can edit this out I, I agree, later. <laughs> I, I agree with you, Nick. I think it's um, you know, I think that kind of stuff needs to be accessible and. Um, you know, I think the world that we live in today, I think, is is you know, is a is a reaction to to those times. You know, if you look back at the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, and the, and certainly, um, I look at you know Britain. I you know, I'm a proud Englishman. I you know, oh yeah, um, I'm very patriotic. I, I you know, <laughs> and I like you Oops. know, and like if we go to the Olympic Games, I'm like Team GB <laughs> all the way, and like I certainly supporting England in the in the football World Cup and. Um, you know, I'm a proud Englishman, um, but um, you know, when I look back at the imperialism of, of the British Empire and some of the things that we did, and, and it was of a time. However, the the where we're living in now, we have to be sensitive to the fact that we are, um, you know, we're the children of that state, and that we have to 
appreciate that um and a lot of people don't like that and it, it invokes sort of fear in a lot of people that we're now we're sort of becoming a rollover nation like we're we're, we're too apologetic for our past and i don't think it, i don't think people expect um countries like britain to to be apologetic these days they just expect us to be sensitive to um other cultures and other nations you know and that's all it is you know they we need to remember that we're one country um you know in a globalized world nowadays and that we all need each other and that all our histories collectively make the world that we live in today including that period the first and second world war um you know we are now responsible for dealing with that now um mm. And, you know, we can't sort of just say, oh, you know, I wasn't alive back then. We're living in the remnants of that now. And um, we we have to show the correct sensitivity. And like, if that means that we've got to be careful yeah. about using our uh, swastikas stickers for educational purposes, then we do have to be careful, I'm afraid. Exactly. You know? We exactly. have to be sensitive because there are people that are living the aftermath of that. Yeah. and And they're alive today. And they need to be considered. And so, if as long as we've got our ears open, you know, it's a, it's it's not nice to hear of somebody getting fired potentially for using material like that when their motivations were right. Um, but you know, at the same time, we do need to keep our ears open and we do need to listen. Yeah. And and react correctly you know there's no point in us being bullshit and saying well look my motivations are all right so i don't <laughs> care we've got to be sensitive to those people who are living in the aftermath of their maybe their parents or their grandparents going through oh, terrible yeah. times you know and and even like you know we're not even talking necessarily about the second world war or the cold war you know even like um you know one of my favorite countries to visit bizarrely enough is ethiopia Oh yeah, and um, awesome. you know they've been, you know, that country, that nation has been through a lot of serious political um, changes in the last sort of fifty years, even. And so when you go there, you can see the aftermath of it. You can see people who have, who, who are alive now, who have lived through difficult, dark periods in their country's history, and you have to be receptive of that if you want to sort of you know if you want to be respected or you want your points of view to be respected you have to be receptive of that exactly kind of thing. so and, and i you know the second world war may not have been in mine or your lifetime yeah. nick you know but certainly people are living in the in the aftermath of, of of those events so we have to always remember that oh yeah no i completely agree i actually uh because of how this stuff is used in the United States by certain groups, I had a, a survey group, like a focus group, come out to my house. They they wanted me to show them uh, kind of like what I do throughout the day. And I had my office door shut because I actually have everything on display in my office. And one of them was an African-American gentleman. And before we went in there, and, you know, at the time, it's no secret I can't grow hair. So I've got to – I occasionally shave my head. And so – I knew I was like, oh, my God, I was like, how am I going to explain this? Because I never really thought about it, because to me, it's just history. Right. But to him, it may not be just that, in which is understandably so. And so before we went in there, I said, all right, sir, I got to I got to talk to you for a second. And I was like, before we go in there, I want to explain my uh, passion for history. And then when we go in there, you're going to understand why I had this conversation with you. <laughs> and so I was like, I don't want to walk in there. You see it and then punch me. So <laughs> and so I told him and he was like, OK. And so I opened it and we walked in. And he saw it all. And he's like, I'm really glad you told me. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, I was like, I uh, I would never want to offend you. And I was like, That's and I just want you to know that I truly I just love history. And I love having stuff like this because it reminds me what in the past we can't let happen again if that makes sense. And he was like, no, I, I completely understand. And I was like, and just for uh, putting it out there, genetically, I just can't grow hair. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> not a part of the movement whatsoever. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> I always tell people I'm, I'm just a baldy. I'm just a baldy. Much <laughs> of my, uh, my, my misfortune. So, but no, I agree. Ethiopia is a very interesting company. I've got a country. I've got a buddy up in Canada. He, uh, he loves Ethiopian history. And, uh, 
that they uh, they definitely gave the fascists a run for their money. Italy was never able to fully uh, subdue Ethiopia. They put up probably one of the most vicious fights that the Italians ever saw. You know, it's uh, it, I always thought it was funny. On a side note, Mussolini has this idea. He's going to create this, you know, new Roman Empire, bring the Roman Empire back. But when they get to Ethiopia, they just, you know, they steamroll at first. But they make a mistake, which the Roman Empire made so many times. They push too fast. They get spread out. And then those brave men and women all over Ethiopia fought tooth and nail to get their country back. And eventually they did. And I always, I always respected them for that. I've never been to Ethiopia myself, but I've heard it's absolutely beautiful. And they definitely have a history, a wonderful history, even though it's sometimes, you know, tragic, like all countries. But I would love to go there. Yeah, so the same is like you mentioned yourself about, um, you know, um, if you don't sort of uh, learn from history, you're condemned to repeat it. And Mussolini was like the, the, <laughs> the man because when the, uh, during the colonialization of Africa, Ethiopia was the country that resisted the Italians in the late 19th century. And then, of course, Mussolini went in there and, and totally underestimated them as, <laughs> yeah. as his fathers and grandfathers before him did. He didn't learn. He didn't and, learn. Uh, ultimately, yeah, he didn't. And I think the you know. ultimate diss is in the end, he couldn't even conquer Greece either. Like, I mean, it's no, just... No, 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 no. It's like, and unfortunately, the Italians are to remember that to this oh, time. Overall, so. he just sucked. <laughs> Oh man, I always uh, there's uh, there's always a bunch of memes, especially about World War II involving uh, fascist Italy, and it uh, it always shows with uh, you'll see uh, Germany and Japan and uh, Italy, and they're at ninety five percent power. When Italy drops out, they go up to a hundred percent power. <laughs> and this, if you're Italian and watching this, I don't mean to offend you. It's just a history joke. I'm sure you get it, especially if you love World War II as much as I do. We can all laugh about it sometimes. But uh, no, the Italians are a very important part of the uh, oh, early 20th century history, and a lot of the reason why um, what happened in Italy was in pure response to oh, yeah, um, you know what we could potentially read as being mistreated by the allies during, after the first world war so um it was you know and um i think you know when you look at all the events of the second world war you can look closely at, at the decisions that were made by the by the us and the french and the, and the yeah. british and 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 really be quite critical of it in hindsight you know and um you know so when you look at each country's history and like you can understand that like the italians were very um you know mussolini initially was very innovative and um you know he was um you know almost almost to be admired if um if you didn't yeah. know what he would go on to do you know it's, well, uh, that is true um uh, but like I mean, I, I've also had the the fortune to visit Italy as well, and um, honestly, it's it's just one of the most mind blowing countries. Oh, yeah. um, I, it's just I can't describe how how mind blowing it is with all the all the opulent history and it, it, like fantastic. I would recommend visiting Italy to absolutely anybody. It's just oh, yeah. mind blowingly awesome. Yeah, I honestly, that's on my, that is my dream trip. One day I will go to Italy and man, just the history that's there from the Celtic history in Northern Italy, going down to the Italian history, the Roman empire, the Hellenistic settlements that were all over Southern Italy and Sicily. Oh man, it'll be the trip of a lifetime. And I honestly, I can't wait. Uh, what you were saying about uh, World War II though, I 100% agree. You know, the allies in the first world war without thinking about it due to the vicious, uh, clauses and, uh, um, restrictions put forward by the treaty of Versailles, for example, I mean, without knowing it, when they signed that paper, they created the second world war, you know, and especially so many men coming back wounded and disgruntled. Germany is currently in the middle of a giant, like communists and right wing radicals are all fighting in the streets the military's in chaos, and eventually a guy who's temporarily blind in a hospital is going to hear that the Germans have lost World War I, and that guy is Adolf Hitler, and later, just by chance, working for the military, he goes to a party that is eventually going to become known as the NSDAP, and unwittingly, you know, at the time, they need somebody to take records, make sure they're not being too unpatriotic, 
And the next thing you know, this young guy, I believe he was a corporal at the time. He uh, he joins the uh, what's going to become the Nazi party. And I think that's one thing interesting about Hitler. And I've always had a big uh, a big controversy over Hitler because I've always been curious to know he was so different according to each crowd that he spoke to. And so you really see these different versions of him. It's hard to find out who he really was as a person. And I always thought it was interesting. Uh, Dr. Thomas Childers wrote a really good book about the Third Reich, especially when it came to the voting system and stuff like that, which is really awesome. Uh, but he talks about how uh, Hitler, before World War I, he associated with many Jewish people. He lived with them in almost like a homeless shelter. Uh, a Jewish person actually would sell his paintings for him. And so he uh, he had all these Jewish acquaintances and even friends. And so many of them after who actually survived World War II and the Holocaust and the horrors that happened, the horrors that occurred after World War II and the aftermath of the chaos in Europe, they said they were so shocked when they finally heard him giving speeches because they had never known that he was, as you would put, anti, not only anti-Semitic, but anti-Jew, uh, anti-Judaic, if you prefer. And so I always found that fascinating. And a part of me always wondered how much of that was actually him versus uh, him towing the party line, per se. And so it's uh, it's absolutely fascinating. And of course, we'll never know uh, unless one day we find a secret diary, which would be absolutely amazing. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know. I, think, I think maybe the, you sort of everyday person now, I think it's very hard to relate to that kind of thing. I mean, certainly the way that I was brought up was like is 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 as far away from Adolf Hitler's mindset as possible. You know, like I mean, yeah. I could imagine ever entertaining the idea of doing the things that he did so for that reason i think how can i possibly ever relate to uh, the mind of a madman you know in yeah. you know as i would look at it and um but still uh, for some reason it fascinates us as human beings oh, yeah. doesn't it and uh, we we have this um we have this inner desire to try and understand or unravel the truth behind it but I, you know honestly i don't think in a, a rational person will ever be able to relate to what he did or, or truly understand why he did what he did so oh no i agree i agree 100 and also you know it makes you wonder how the situation going back to what you said nick about the treaty of versailles and how how much that manifested um you know how many possible adolf hitlers were there oh yeah in germany during the 1920s you know and um you know, it just makes you wonder how much that kind of pressure um, can manifest itself into something that, that you know, what happened, what ultimately happened, you know. So, um, but yeah, it's um, once again, you have to be respectful of, oh, of yeah. the outcome, but um, still, you know, you can't help wanting to sort of understand it. And, and that's why people read about it and study it and, you um, uh, you know we do have to be careful and like okay. and i and i and i won't lie to you i'm sort of almost dreading that that part of my podcast when i yeah. get to that point <laughs> the fact that i you know the further forward i go the, the the more carefully i have to tread and um i you know i want to get it right you know so like part of like volume three i've got coming up nick is like on the the, the classical world and one of the first things i'm going to be focusing on is is persia um which will lead up so from you know from when the, the fall of the Assyrian Empire it will lead right up to the uh, to the to the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad and uh, basically the the origins of Islam and I want to try and get that um, I want to try and get that right you know and try and put the put the story across the way that people would want me to put the story across, you know, and you're never going to get it right by everybody. You know this, Nick, from the from the videos you create and yeah. you, you, <laughs> some of the comments, uh, you know, you, you're never going to get it 100 percent right. And I always said to people that if 10 percent of people on YouTube disapprove of your work, that's a good number. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, like, so, if you get ninety percent on board, you're doing a good job. Um, so, I think you're always gonna you you have to sort of reach out to people and and say, you know, is this correct? And you have to take people's feedback very seriously. I think you know, and um, and that's I think that's also another important part of what we do, Nick, is um, the fact that we 
we are just basically um you know conveyors of information people do respect our opinions when it's made respectfully uh, but that's not really my job to give the opinion that just sort of try that enhances the work that we do and i think it's important that we do put across the the information as respectfully and as correctly as possible and you know we do try and stick to the mainstream line because we you know if you want to have a, a respectable product um the likes of which i'm trying to make with the history of the world podcast you've got to listen to people and you've got to take on board their criticisms and you've got to try and follow the mainstream vibe because that's what people are ultimately looking for for certainly from my work you know and if they want to look at pseudoscience so they'll, they'll go and look for that you know and that kind yeah. of thing but um you know if like you try and stick to the mainstream you try and use the literature you've got at your disposal and you try and triangulate and coalesce that information into something that's acceptable and i think you know when we're exploring subjects that can be quite controversial such as the third reich oh, you know yeah. you have to try and triangulate as much as possible and put forward your points of view and the points of information as respectfully as possible um and i think as long as you have that in the back of your mind you should ultimately you know hopefully get away with you know doing it correctly oh no i completely agree um i will say that in the future when you actually do approach the more modern era and stuff like that one thing i was very happy about is the uh subscription service that i have that provides me a lot of the videos that i use throughout my uh uh my own youtube channel they actually have a ton that is relating to the soviet union the allies uh even the third reich german soldiers fighting like they literally have professionally filmed footage everything from explosions to shooting trench warfare i honestly i can't wait to use it like it's gonna be absolutely fantastic you know bring a saving private ryan feel to the uh, podcast so to speak so I'm really excited about that. And I'm excited about volume three. I'm really excited. I actually hadn't heard about that until just now. So it's a nice little sneak peek into the future right there. Yeah, I'm hoping we get that underway. I'm looking I'm looking at the 14th of December for um, the first episode now. We've like we've sort of been effectively offline for the, for for almost two months now. And um I do, you know, I do need a bit of a breather, you know, because like we knocked out thirty seven weekly episodes there. <laughs> I haven't got a clue how I did it. I just, like if you ask me how I did it, I can't tell you. I just did it. I just went into autopilot and knocked it out. And uh but now I like I've appreciated the rest. Um the producing pod or writing podcasts without that pressure of a deadline sitting over me but um, i'm sort of in a position now where i can sort of you know i think you know within what are we now 20 so i think saturday the 14th of december should be the opening uh, episode of volume three so looking oh, forward to it no i am i'm very very excited i'm sure that most of my subscribers on youtube are going to be pretty thrilled to hear that as well i hope so so that'll be that'll be absolutely absolutely fantastic I think this went really well. I'm really excited about this. I, uh, I've noticed the more and more that I interview people, the more comfortable I am on camera too. And I'm finally happy to be finally getting over that. Oh my gosh. I absolutely hate being on camera. That's one of the other secrets about me. And unfortunately with what I'm doing, it's pretty much a must. So, <laughs> well, I mean, this is a first for me. I'm, I'm used to having the, the, the luxury of being able to sort of, um, you know, sit in my underpants doing podcasts, but not to <laughs> <laughs> not that I had to make an effort today. So. I could do that on YouTube, but I don't think anybody wants to see it. <laughs> home if I do that, so I don't even want to see it. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, that would be really, that would be really funny. But uh, no, that's uh, that's exciting. I cannot wait. Volume three. That's going to be a big deal. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is concluding our presentation today. You got to meet Chris Haslow of the History of the World podcast, and he is an absolutely, as you can tell, phenomenal guy. I've got high hopes for his podcast. He's got a goal. He's going to meet it. And I am happy that y'all get to take advantage of what he has to offer y'all because it's people like him that make podcasting what it is. Educational, phenomenal, entertaining, and absolutely brilliant. Chris, it was a pleasure, sir.
thank you very much. Thanks for um, you know this entertaining interview, and I hope um, I hope anyone that watches it has uh, you know enjoyed it likewise. So uh, thank you very much, Nick, and keep uh, keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely, will do, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, definitely check out the video description below, which will give you links to not only his Patreon account, so you can help him make history, but also it'll give you links to where you can go and listen to his podcast directly. So if you're at the gym, you don't want to watch my channel, you should definitely be listening to his podcast. Give you a reason to work out harder, hearing about all these battles and political events and so on and so forth. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much. And have a great night.